Hello, and this is Josh Wander, host of the Prep Report. This is the only show in the nation dedicated exclusively to disaster and emergency preparedness. Thank you for joining us tonight. It's going to be an exciting show. We have a debate, and we have great debaters here for you. The topic is going to be gun control, and the debaters are Kim Stolfer from Firearms Owners Against Crime and David Ledvansky, who is a former state representative in Pennsylvania, and he's going to be representing Ceasefire PA. Now, we've already gone through the rules. We have a two-minute opening statement, and then they will take questions. By coin toss, Kim Stolfer has, uh, has decided to go first, and, uh, and David will go opening, he'll have the opening, uh, the, the closing statements. So we're going to start our timer, and whenever you're ready, Kim, you can start your opening statement. I'm ready. The issue of the ownership of firearms is a very emotionally charged one in this country. There are those that don't fully understand the ramifications of limitations that continue to be piled upon. What most don't really grasp is a constitutional freedom. We feel the hold criminals responsible, and then we blame the inanimate object as if um, banning cars or regulating cars even more would do something to impact drunk driving. Um, the list of firearms regulations goes all the way back over 70 years, back to 1934, when it was actually government arms used in the crimes that were committed by the gangs that were ones used. Nick Dillinger got them from government National Guard armories. So uh, as you move through the years, you find a unwillingness on the part of government to accept the fact that one, government gun laws do not work and that they are a limitation and predication of the freedoms of the average citizen on the misdeeds of others and we need to move forward and look for solutions, and we're not doing that. We brand it as some simple solution, like a light switch, and then we want to move on. So I got involved over 30 years ago, and I'm very concerned that uh, we've lost sight of our identity as a nation, of our freedoms, and we really need to refocus ourselves on what the experts are telling us and not politicians that manipulate the issues to suit their purposes in re-election campaigns. Thank you, Kim. Okay, um, let's start with your opening statement. Thank Dave. you, Josh. P appreciate the opportunity to be here to discuss, uh, to discuss this issue and this subject, and, and also in the context of given this show is for emergency responders. Uh, it's appropriate that this subject is, is being discussed here because there are the first people called to the scene uh, of w when crimes are committed. And there's over 100,000 uh, people in this country that are killed or maimed every year with firearms, with firearms. And it's the emergency responders, it's the EMTs and the paramedics and the, and the police and the, and the firefighters that are often the, the called the, the, the first to the scene. So I think they have a, clearly an interest in seeing measures enacted and government taking a role to reduce the incidence of violent crime committed through, with the use of firearms in our country. Um, I also just want to just take a second to make it clear. This isn't a, the, the calling it gun control is really misnaming the entire debate. That's not what this is about. It's not about controlling anything. It's about recognizing a problem in our society and crafting measures to deal effectively to resolve the problem or to minimize its impact to the extent that that is possible. So it really is a, a, a public debate about gun safety measures and promoting individual responsibility in the use of firearms. As a hunter, as a gun owner, I mean I use guns for, for hunting, for target shooting, for self-defense as well, so I, I understand that. Uh, I also understand that with my individual right to bear arms comes responsibilities. I must operate that firearm in a responsible manner. There's one yet second amendment to the Constitution. Sometimes we forget that with rights come responsibilities. Similarly, the first amendment to the Constitution gives us all the right to free speech. But I'm not allowed to say anything that would slander 
Mr. Stolfer, okay? It would, you know, or would cause him harm. Uh, that's why we have slander and libel laws. So with rights come responsibilities, and that's really what this debate's all about. Okay. Kim, let me start with you. Sure. David's made a good point. The uh, firefighters, the police, the military, those are the ones that should be carrying the guns. Those are the ones that are at risk. Why should private citizens have access to assault rifles, to weapons that can, can have so much, can, can be such a destructive force? Well, that's one of the interesting things about this is that we tend to have a 30 second soundbite society. Everybody forgets the LA riots, the Katrina riots that were down there when firearms were seized, people were put at risk by government, taking property illegally and then having to give it back but accounting not for the lives that were lost. And it's the first responders, I praise them up and down. But remember, the real first victims are the people that are there in a crime where the first responders sometimes take upwards, the national average is 23 minutes, up to 45 minutes depending on your locality. So people should have access to whatever firearms they need. And it's not a matter of need, it's a matter of choice. And that's what the Bill of Rights is about. It says those freedoms, those bills of articles under the Bill of Rights shall not be infringed, shall not be questioned. And I think it's time that we recognize that we are doing that to the detriment of all. Thank you. Would you like to respond? Yeah. There is no Constitution. Not, none of the rights in the Constitution um, are absolute. Okay, um, I mentioned about the right to free speech and the fact that it doesn't give you the right to libel or slander somebody or you know, you're just not allowed to do that. Um, the right to bear arms. You know, the, and, and those of us that are gun owners and, and hunters, we understand what the Heller Supreme Court decision a couple years ago with the United States Supreme Court, it made it clear that not only is the right to bear arms extend to states, rights to form militias back when the Constitution was, was, um, was written, um, but also it gives an individual right, an individual right to own a gun uh, to defend themselves, their family, or their property. So that, that right now is enshrined in the state, in our, in our, in our Constitution and, and in our Supreme Court decision. But the question becomes, but that right is not absolute, okay? Back in the 1930s, in response to gangland murders, um, Congress banned the sale of machine guns, rapid fire machine guns, automatic weapons. I think it's time that we take a look at these high velocity, rapid fire, semi-automatic weapons, because there's clearly a threat to public safety. Okay, um, Dave, you mentioned, I mean, Kim mentioned earlier, the fact that um, we have to take some self-responsibility, that, that uh, a, a gun owner is in his, in his home, and they can't expect to rely only on the police, on the, on the first responders to be there, because they can't be everywhere all the time, and clearly it takes them time to respond to, to an incident. What is, what is a, a, a person, what is a family supposed to do in that, in, that time, in that interim period where they're waiting for the police to show up? Absolutely, which is why the right to bear arms gives an individual, if they feel that in their particular living circumstances or for whatever reason they want to own a gun for self-defense and protection, they're entitled legally to do that. I don't think most, you know, mo most citizens, most gun owners, most NRA members, most sportsmen don't have any problem with that. But you've got to ask yourself, Josh, what kind of gun are you going to use to defend yourself in that situation? You're going to use either a handgun or, my preference, a shotgun with double watt buckshot. You don't need an AR-15 or an AK-47, okay, to defend yourself in your home if somebody's coming through the door. You want a pistol that you have quick access to or you want a shotgun that's going to throw enough and, and, and enough coverage out there uh, to certainly, you know, incapacitate that person. That's what you use for self-defense. Assault weapons, by definition, are offensive weapons. They're not used for defense. They have a place for the military, for SWAT teams, for law enforcement. I, you know, I, you know, we accept that. But they're not weapons that are needed. And just because someone says, well, I need them or I choose to have them, well, what if I choose to have a, a surface-to-air missile? 
where does the right to bear arms begin and end? Does it give me the right to own a shoulder-mounted surface-to-air missile? How about a bazooka? Okay, I want one. Mm -hmm. No, this is about this is about respecting people's constitutional right in a sane society designed to promote public safety. Would you like to respond? Oh, absolutely. Um, what Dave is talking about is not res firearm safety. He's talking about limiting rights, and it's clearly enshrined in the Constitution. These are personal weapons, not some surface-to-air missile. But since people want to take and look at this, first, there's some factoids you need to know. Firearms are the most regulated commodity in this country. Nothing is close. And then on top of that, we talk about laws. Here's the laws. Here's the federal laws. Okay? Here's the state laws, the current state laws. And Dave here was part and parcel of enacting some of the worst ones of these. And I'm telling you that these laws impact law-abiding citizens because criminals don't care. England found out they're the most violent country on this planet, and they got twice the violent crime rate that America does. You want to bring this to these lands? Follow what he says. Last question for Kim. Um, I mean, it's just a little bit... Um, I think it's, it's Kim's question. Yes. Oh, that's right. Kim, um, Dave pointed out, yes, firearms, no assault weapons. Um, can't we differentiate and say that there are certain weapons, like a pistol, like a shotgun, which he admits is something that is, is effective to be used uh, for self-defense, and an assault rifle, an AR-15, an AK-47, is that something that's really necessary for a, an average citizen to own and to use for self-defense purposes? The whole purpose of this uh, discussion is to try to get at the heart of the problems we have with people committing crimes. Here we devolve into Buicks and Chevrolets. So we want to talk about so-called assault weapons. He is even misnaming it. Real assault weapons are fully automatic. These are nothing more than cosmetic differences for semi-automatic rifles. He should know better. He's a hunter. The fact is, is what they did is they dressed it up. There hasn't been anybody killed by a bayonet lug or a grenade launcher, but that's the way they define these types of firearms. It's like taking a spoiler off a sports car, putting it on a family sedan, and calling a family sedan a hot rod. It doesn't change anything. That's why the, the so-called assault weapon ban was changed. As far as need goes, you ask the people in L.A. riots when the police abandoned them, and a dozen other destabilized situations, Katrina in Florida during the tornadoes, in Louisiana when they had other flooding problems down there. This has happened all across the country. Do you want a two-shot gun and you're surrounded by a dozen gang members, a five-shot gun or a handgun, where you're going to run out and you may not be able to shoot it accurately? Or do you want something you can respond effectively with and in certain circumstances, yes. But these firearms are also used in hunting. 47 states you can use them in hunting. And he knows that as well. And also, they're used in competitions all across this country, the Civilian Marksmanship Program. So lying about what the uses are of these firearms is tantamount to trying to dissuade people from understanding what the real issues are. You like to respond? Yeah, let's see. I hunt Pennsylvania and Ohio uh, pretty extensively for white-tailed deer. You are not allowed to use a rifle at all to hunt deer in Ohio. You're allowed to use rifles in Pennsylvania. Rifles, okay? You know, typically not assault rifles, not semi-automatic rifles. Semi-automatic rifles you're not allowed to hunt uh, deer with in Pennsylvania. And even shotguns, even you know, even a semi-automatic um, shotgun. When you're hunting small game, you're limited to three shells in your magazine. We have significant restrictions and limitations on the use of, of firearms if you want to go hunting. Okay, very tight regulations relative to what you're allowed, what kind of weapon you're allowed to use for hunting and its capacity as well. Very much limited. Okay, in the interest of what? In the interest of promoting safety amongst hunters in Pennsylvania, so that we can reduce the incidence of, of gun accidents in the state. And we've done that in the state through effective regulation of the kind of guns that could be used while hunting and also promoting gun safety and education and training in Pennsylvania. We've brought the number of accidents down 
in amongst hunting in the state. Okay, next question for you, Dave. In 1994, uh, under President Clinton, there was an assault, ban, an assault rifle ban enacted. Uh, it, went, it lasted for 10 years until uh, it, it finished under, under President Bush. Um, there was a 10-year trial of an assault weapons ban. Uh, and many people claim that that, w that failed because uh, violent crime did not, uh, was not lowered during that period of time. What makes you think that additional legislation now is going to succeed where the original Brady Bill failed? Well, first off, I, I don't buy the assumption that violent crime um, um, wasn't reduced during that period of time, okay? You could look at different studies and interpret it different ways. Um, but let me put it to you this way, Josh. I mean, so, the, so, the, so that the, uh, the pro-gun side of the equation, okay, they effectively, I mean, they, say, they lobby against strong laws. When, when, the, you know, when they passed the assault weapon ban, they wrote it in such a way that so many weapons, the, you know, the definition of assault rifle is so narrow, okay, that, that so many of them weren't covered by it. So you, you write a law, and, and, and the gun advocate side, the pro-gun, you know, the pro-industry side of the equation lobbies for weakening amendments, and then when the law is finally enacted and takes effect, and it's in effect, and, it, and, and then when crime happens and these mass murders happen, then they point to it and say, well, see, you have laws on the book that don't work. Well, they don't work because they lobby for weak laws, for loopholes, okay, uh, for weaker provisions. And then they say, well, see, the laws don't work, so we shouldn't do any more laws. No, we should just pass laws that are effective and that are targeted to address the problem effectively. That's what you have to do. But I think it's absolutely hypocritical to say, you know, to, 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 to lobby against strong laws, to push weakening amendments, and then when crime happens, say, see, the, the, the law doesn't work, and all we need to do is punish criminals more. We need stronger penalties. That's not an effective deterrent. Look, I was at the gun range a couple weeks ago sighting in my flintlock, my muzzle loader. Some guy walked up there with an AK-47, shooting at the target, throwing out brass 10, 15 feet, hit me in the, in, the, in, in the side of the shoulder. I couldn't even shoot my gun. I had to step back. I asked him politely, what do you need a gun like that for? He had no good answer. After d different ways of asking it, he says, to take care of whatever comes up over the mountain. Why do we need these weapons? If you're a hunter, if you're a law enforcement for self-defense, you don't need an AR-15, an AK-47, and guns like that. Thank you, Dave. Would you like to respond? Yes. First of all, again, America and the Constitution is not about need. It's meant to keep people like Dave, who are legislators. Now, he says, from infringing on rights, he says we lobby against gun, uh, strong gun laws. No. He knows who lobbies against strong gun laws. The Philadelphia contingent. He was tight with them when he was in the legislature. The fact of the matter is, is that we rewrote, we, Firearms Owners Against Crime and, and Sportsman's Group, rewrote the, the uh, law on domestic violence, House Bill 1717. Spent eight months doing that. Any time we've ever been in Harrisburg working on crime legislation, as a matter of, we, it has always been us only and ceasefire hasn't been there. There are other bills that have been, that have come up that they've actually voted against. They didn't want the changes in a number of areas where we were talking about emergency situations, and that's appropriate for this show. Kim. Dave just mentioned loopholes. One of the most famous of the loopholes that is uh, constantly cited is that of the gun shows. Uh, considering the fact that here in Pennsylvania, one is able to transfer a long gun from citizen to citizen without any background check whatsoever, regardless of whether it's in a gun show or outside of a gun show, why do you think that's acceptable that th those people that are transferring weapons over to other individuals in the state are not going through a basic background check. You know, we'll let them go through a check where they're ch whether they're, they're mentally challenged, whether they're, uh, they're a convicted felon. Don't you think that these things are something that every individual, even any responsible gun owner, would accept and would want? Well, let's take a look at this. First of all, we wrote into Pennsylvania Uniform Firearms Act 
and they voted against it. It was legislation and law that said that if you transfer a firearm to somebody, you are criminally and civilly responsible for anything that happens with that firearm. We wrote that, not cease fire. And yet it's never used. It has not been used yet by a judge or a district attorney. Police officers are upset about that. I talk to the line officers all the time. So there are measures to take care of these type of people. The fact is, the loophole you're talking about doesn't really exist because people that do this are supposed to be held accountable. And we have that in law already. And the firearms that are transferred at gun shows, if they're a dealer, every firearm has to go through the background check, the picks check. And I think it's long overdue that we take a look at what is actually in the law, like a straw purchase sale. If you do one straw purchase sale, do you know the amount of time in prison one firearm can bring the person and gives it to a prohibited individual is 22 years under current Pennsylvania law. And yet we have a shooting that was done just down here uh, by the station where uh, the person uh, sold 10 firearms. You know, and they only got nine months probation. So is that being serious about laws? No. Look at Philadelphia, Khalil Slight. Look at the DA. Look at what, uh, how they passed more laws that violate Pennsylvania firearms law, preemption law, and yet nobody holds those uh, community leaders responsible. Isn't that a crime? Yes, under Pennsylvania law. But Dave says nothing about that because it fits what is convenient modus operandi. So I think we need to look broader than this. Would you like to respond? Yes. Josh, 40% of guns sold in this country are exempt from the background check. And it's principally because, as you mentioned, the gun show loophole and private sales via the internet. If I go down to Savage Arms or Ace Arms, Ace Firearms or, or, or Braverman Arms, if I go there to buy a gun, I've, they're going to do all the paperwork, the thorough background check before I'm able to walk out of there with a gun. But that, that arms dealer down at the, at the gun show, he doesn't have to do that. He or she doesn't have to do that. There's private sales that go on via the Internet in, in many cases, exempt from the background check. You know, this is one area that gun owners, that sportsmen, that even NRA members agree with public sentiment. Eighty-seven percent of Americans, when questioned, say no exemptions. Total background checks for anybody who wants to get a gun. Even, even, even um, 74% of NRA members agree with that, according to a Republican conservative poll of NRA members. So there is a, an area where we could form broad consensus on promoting gun safety measures and full background checks with no exemptions and full access to databases that are comprehensive. These are two major areas that would address the problem that there's broad public support for. Thank you. David, you mentioned that um, the NRA, and the NRA, after what happened in Sandy Hook, we all know, came out with a statement expressing the need for armed uh, guards at schools. Um, my question to you is, gun-free zones, is, is it a logical thing to say that you can legislate this kind of thing? Are you really telling a criminal, is a criminal going to listen to you when you write gun-free zone in front of that school and not come in and do whatever hideous act that he'd like to? Look, I'm, I'm not going to purport to, to, I'm not going to say that I can understand the mentality of criminals and what makes them target certain, you know, schools, malls, churches, synagogues, wh what have you, okay? Um, but this notion that the solution to the problem of gun violence is to make sure every school teacher, every administrator is armed is absolutely ludicrous. I mean, let's take this ra rationale to its logical conclusion. In a world with a proliferation of nuclear weapons, would it be more or less safe if every country in the world had a nuclear bomb? It'd be less safe. Well, why do we accept a different rationale in this case? There are already over 283 million guns in possession by citizens across this country, okay? Um, so we need more guns to deal with this? No. No, we don't need more guns. We need more effective laws, and we need to take, in my judgment, these AR-15s and, and AK-47s out of circulation. They don't have, nobody needs them. Uh, law enforcement needs them. But for self-defense, for legitimate self-defense, and for hunting purposes, 
these guns are absolutely unnecessary. Um, uh, but, but look, I, you know, but we're going to continue to have, I mean, how many more of these incidents do we have to have? 100,000 people killed or injured a year with guns. How long to, is it going to be until we actually do something to address the problem? Thank you. Would you like to respond? Yes. First of all, it's not 100,000. All, all Dave has to do and ceasefire has to do is look at Bureau of Just Statistics. And they don't do that. They dream up their own numbers from the Violence Policy Center. So once again, the lies are spreading. They dreamed up the concept of so-called assault weapons back in 1988. I have the original report. So when we talk about this and we talk about what people should do to stop this, it doesn't rely in need. What it does is rely on an examination of all the factors involved. And unfortunately, we are not doing that. And I have to come back around. Uh, he says, uh, firearms arming every teacher. That's a pie in the sky. That's, that's like throwing a pancake at somebody and expecting it to cover everything. That's meant to delude the people. Don't listen to this argument. They're talking about flight deck officer programs like they have on airlines, like they have air marshals. So there's more to it than this. And you, I just invite everybody to take a little deeper look, and you'll see where the truth is. OK, Kim. Dave mentioned a, a statistic. You, you mentioned a different statistic about how many people are injured in this country, how many deaths are caused by gun violence in this country. Uh, over a period of year, but clearly, it's it's much much higher than you find in European countries, in, in England where they ban guns, in Australia where they ban guns. Um, whether it's 35 to 13,000 or whatever the numbers are, clearly we're many times at the amount of, of injuries and deaths here in the United States. Why do you think that is acceptable? Why shouldn't we be trying to do something to limit those? Well, we should be trying to uh, do something to limit those. But the fact is that America is not the most violent planet on our uh, country in this planet. England, Scotland, and others are above that. Do they have trauma centers there? Yes. Do they have running gun battles in England? Yes. There was just a newspaper article came out in the UK that where they talked about kids buying machine guns for $320 in classrooms. I have the article. They arrested the kid. The guy had a trunk full, literally trunk full of these firearms. So what we're talking about here is actually to make people safer. Do we really want to pursue a very weak aspect of this? Or do we want to do something concrete about it? The fact is, there's only about 12,000 people killed in crime with firearms. The rest are suicides, up to approximately 33,000. Then from there on, Injured, you were going to drag that in injured. We we're going to talk about because they lump every other situation in with it. It's like they call a, a kid being shot. The kid's all the way up to the age of 25, and they include gang members. So you have to be, not be disingenuous in the way you approach this and tell people what they really need to know. Thank you. You're welcome. Dave, speaking of, do you, do you want to respond to that? Yeah. 30, by his, I'll take his number. 33,000 people killed a year in this country with guns. Add up the next 22 highest countries, okay, uh, with, with, with crime. They don't have, you add them all up, it's not 33,000 people killed a year with guns. We live in a gun, a gun worshiping, violence ridden culture in society, and we pay the price for it. 33,000 people a year killed killed with guns, not just maimed, killed. That's eight 9-11s every year. How much is too much? What does it take for us to recognize? Over a million people have been killed in this country since Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King were assassinated with guns back in 1968. Over a million people killed with guns, okay? It's time that we recognize that this culture in our country, okay, uh, you know, needs to recognize that, that, that the access to rapid fire, high capacity weapons is certainly part of the solution. Limiting those is certainly part of the solution to this national problem. Now, now 
Dave, you, you would be the first one to admit that uh, I think it's, it's everyone knows that most crime in this country are not, is not committed uh, by law-abiding citizens. You know, gun owners in this country, most of the, the, the people that are injured and killed by, by, by firearms in this country are not by the, the, the legal licensed gun owners. Over 80%, I believe, are from gang members. Um, who are we punishing here? Are we punishing the people that are, that are the, the, the law-abiding citizen as opposed to punishing the people that should be punished, the, the criminals? Well, I mean, certainly we've passed all these laws on the books to, to punish criminals. But obviously, just punishing criminals isn't, isn't uh, a comprehensive enough solution. Okay? Look, you know, if, if, if a person is bent on, on mayhem, on, on destruction, you know, are they going to pick up a knife and, uh, you know, on the same day that those poor children were, were murdered in Newtown, um, a, a knife-wielding criminal in China, okay, went and slashed a bunch of people. I think only a couple of them died. But if you have an AR-15, okay, I mean, that's kind of like a cold, calculated way to kill as many people as you can in a kind of a detached uh, situation. Look, these, these high-capacity rapid-fire weapons, um, in my judgment, uh, uh, Judge Scalia, the conservative on the court, you know, in the Heller decision, you know, appropriately said, we have the right to bear arms, but government has the, a responsibility to enact measures to protect the public, to promote public safety. You've got to balance public safety with individual rights and responsibilities. Thank you. Would you like to respond? Yes, please. Uh, yes, there are uh, a number of people hurt and maimed. And yes, uh, firearms do facilitate that in some circumstances. But what happened? Why did the person have the firearm? Did you ever see the media talk about that? No. When there's a crime, did they follow up and they find out where the firearm came from? Very rarely. And when they do, it came from the Iron Triangle. Dave doesn't talk about that. He doesn't talk about Senator Greenleaf, who uh, puts a low value on firearms laws and then it gets to the courts and what was five years, the will of the legislature gets nailed down and ratcheted down to nine months or time served. Again, we have a problem with prosecuting criminals and you're right, Josh, we are holding law-abiding citizens responsible and we don't have to go to Dave to find out who needs what. Okay, well, I thank you both for this very spirited uh, discussion. Um, I'm going to, since you had the opening statement, Kim, uh, we're going to give the closing statements, uh, the closing remarks to, to David. Yeah. Um, look, the solutions to the, inc to the high incidence of violence and gun-related violence in this country isn't, isn't to make it easier for more people to own more guns. It's to, it's to pass laws that balance the rights and responsibilities of individual citizens with the need to promote public safety and public protection. Um, this notion, and if we're going to ever put together a solution, it's got to be comprehensive. We're going to have to look at accessing more mental health records of people and putting those in the database so we can do comprehensive background searches. It's certainly going to involve, I think, looking at, looking at the violence and the cultural violence in our country through, through video games and movies and things like that. But it also needs to examine the access to these high-powered weapons of mass destruction. And to continue to point it and say the problems with Hollywood or the media, you know, and the solution is to make sure everybody owns a gun is just absolutely nonsense. I mean, just, you know, just, just in our um, brief time in the last few years, how many more new towns, how many more Seattle malls, Seattle malls, Aurora, Colorado's, Virginia Tech's, Columbine's, Fort Hood's, Sick, Sick of Temples in Michigan's, the three police officers in Pittsburgh that were assassinated a few years ago, the, uh, the, the, the carnage down at the LA Fitness Center in, in Bridgeville. I mean, a lot of these things don't get that much media attention, okay? 34,000 people killed a year under his estimate. How much more of this human carnage do we have to tolerate, okay? Do we have to tolerate? What we need to do in this country is do an effective, comprehensive approach to lessening gun violence. And it's going to be a multifaceted uh, solution that's going to take a, a lot of cooperation and participation by a lot of stakeholder groups in our society. But we've got to get past this notion that the solution to the problem of gun violence is make sure everybody has more guns. That's ludicrous and nonsense. Thank you. Kim, your closing statement. 
In our nation, we have a long, rich history of constitutional freedoms. We hold sacrosanct certain things. First Amendment, there's a reason why they put them in a special section of the Constitution. Second Amendment ends and shall not be infringed. Pennsylvania's Bill of Rights says shall not be questioned. I showed you where we have thousands of laws now that are questions, but that's not enough. Why? We want to take away people's freedoms? We want to throw them in the dustbin of history? We want to use that threshold that Dave talks about? Okay, I'll give them a threshold. How many, doc how many people do doctors kill every year? Doctors kill over 100,000 Americans. Hospitals, another 70,000. Prescriptions, another 110,000. But it's okay for them to see that kind of level of carnage. What are we going to do? Hold doctors responsible now? Because he set the threshold. I didn't. If it's going to be something we want to fix, we can fix it. But we have to stop focusing on inanimate objects. We have to go after what is causing the problem. Hold people accountable. We don't hold Hollywood accountable, even though Lieutenant Colonel Doug David Grossman says that that part of the brain that is affected by video games is changed for life with these kids. Every school shooting that's happened, they didn't say anything about that. They had SSRI inhibitors, antidepressants, Luvox, Anafenil, Prozac. They were all involved in this. Ceasefire doesn't care about that. Their agenda is to take your firearms and we stand in the way of that because we have enough laws. There were 31 laws that were broken in Connecticut, and in every situation, that's been the case. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, David. Thanks, Tom. This has been a wonderful discussion. I hope that our viewers will also uh, appreciate it and understand uh, and, and investigate more, because there's obviously a lot more that we couldn't uh, cover during this segment. Hopefully, we'll have future segments uh, about the topic. But we encourage you to come to our, our, our second uh, segment which will deal with a discussion of some of these issues. And uh, please stay tuned. Thank you very much. Thank you.